Good morning and welcome to the 40th annual commencement ceremonies of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Welcome to the Goldman School faculty, students, staff, family, friends, and of course, most of all, congratulations to the graduating class of 2010. This is my first commencement as Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. It's really thrilling to be here. In my first year as Dean, I've had the chance to get to know uh, many of the graduate students and the faculty even better and the wonderful staff we have at the Goldman School. It's really been a thrilling and wonderful and exciting year and it's tremendous to be here at the end of the year for the graduation and to see everybody arrayed in front of me, uh, all, mostly in their mortar boards. I don't have one, I don't like wearing it, it sort of seems to fall off. But many of you seem to have better skills at balancing things than I do. That's, that's one of our courses, balancing mortar boards. So good job. Today we honor and celebrate the class of 2010 and their many accomplishments. There are 71 students who have completed the Masters of Public Policy. Uh, 66 are actually here today to receive their diplomas. Others are traveling and doing other things. And we have two students who will receive their PhD in public policy. Let me just tell you a little bit about what this class has done in their advanced policy analysts, because this effort, which is essentially their master's uh, degree project, really gives you an idea of what people at the Goldman School do and why we have such a great record of contribution to American public policy and now increasingly to public policy throughout the world. So here's some of the topics on which people wrote. Children and vulnerable populations, uh, finding and reuniting children abducted during the Salvadoran Civil War, combating human trafficking, children and chronic disease, in another area, climate change, renewable energy, we have people who are doing work on climate change and energy use plans in France, Oakland, Richmond, Vallejo, the United States, Japan, Tanzania, Uganda, and China, all around the world. Energy efficiency efforts, clean vehicles, green jobs, urban agriculture, and my favorite in this subcategory, weather insurance for developing countries, but with climate change, that might be an important thing. Schools, we have people working in the areas of schooling, uh, educational technology in the developing world, evidence-based schools, creating diverse neighborhood schools, teach for Pakistan, programs to alleviate and end poverty and improve health safety nets, uh, social programs in Peru and India, measuring and understanding poverty, jobs programs, dealing with payday lending, which is often a problem for people in the ghettos in America uh, who use the payday lenders but find out that the rates are usurious and difficult to repay. Uh, ending intergenerational poverty in Mexico. Several APAs were on better government, voter information, better budgeting, civic leadership, and a public policy think tank in Malaysia. Healthcare, evidence-based healthcare, health care for undocumented, uh, health and water sanitation, and many other topics. Criminal justice, reducing violence in Oakland, re-engaging youth in San Francisco, getting juvenile offenders to school, investing in high-risk youth. Other people have worked on military policy, water policy, economic and development policy, and perhaps my favorite as I drive around, paving the roads. So GSPP students are trained and equipped to deal with all sorts of public policy problems. One of our great strengths is we give them a toolkit, we talk a lot about that, we give them the skills, and we also give them, ultimately in their APAs and in other efforts, clients who they can work with and learn how to actually use the tools they've been given to solve public policy problems. And the result is our graduates do exceptionally well in the job market. Uh, they go out and ultimately have extraordinary careers where they do all sorts of amazing things with respect to public policy. Through the hard work and determination of this class, uh, you can now join 1,500 other GSPP alumni who have preceded you. 
As our newest group of Goldman School alumni, not quite yet, but close to it, we look forward to all of the exciting work that you're going to be doing. So we look forward to watching your careers and we will constantly be in touch with you because we love to find out what our students are doing. We love to stay in contact. You're gonna provide us with clients. Uh, and you'll be the clients for our APAs and our IPAs. Uh, you'll be the people we'll turn to to find out what's happening in all sorts of important public policy areas. And many of you are gonna come back, I hope, and uh, be at the school and talk to classes and tell us about the extraordinary work that you're doing. So we really look forward to your careers and what you're gonna be doing. With that in mind, let me turn it over to one of our graduates. Stuart Drown is a GSPP graduate from 1986. He's currently the executive director of the Little Hoover Commission in Sacramento, which investigates state operations and provides recommendations and proposals to improve effectiveness and efficiency. Stuart is also the chair of the GSPP Alumni Association Board of Directors, and he wants to welcome you uh, here for the graduation on behalf of the Alumni Board of Directors. Stuart. Thank, Thank you. you. Dean Brady, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to stand before you this morning to congratulate you on completing your, your Master's of Public Policy. Uh, and also to officially welcome you to the Goldman School of Public Policy Alumni Association. As alumnus of UC Berkeley and of the, the Goldman School, we are confident that you will take what you've learned here and make a difference in the world. Today you join a community of GSPP alumni who are dedicated to making the world a better place and who are committed to helping GSPP, its faculty, its students, its staff, and most importantly, uh, the world around you. As our newest members of the GSPP Alumni Association, there are several ways that you can give back to your alma mater. Whether you give back monetarily or give back by volunteering your time to mentor a current GSPP student or to contact newly admitted uh, GSPP students to answer questions about your experience here or to provide internships or IPAs or APAs or later jobs, any way that you can give back to the school will always be greatly appreciated. Again, on behalf of the Goldman School of Public Policy Alumni Association and its board of directors, Welcome and congratulations to you, the class of 2010. And now it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Khadija Bakhtiar, who has been selected by you as the student speaker this morning. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Brown. So, <laughs> Dean Brady, Professor Nocht, members of the faculty and staff, proud, proud parents, and newly certified public policy analysts. <laughs> Good morning. So, this is it. Two years of regression analysis and maths and the true and righteous eightfold path <laughs> and a lifetime's worth of friendships formed on the soccer field and over happy hours. And it all comes down to this. It is summed up by this one moment in which I stand here to speak before you wearing what is essentially a glorified raincoat. <laughs> and. Um, this magnificent tasseled cap. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound cheap, but $65 for a graduation gown? <laughs> Whatever happened to good old rentals? I just, you know, seeing as how I'm a public policy analyst, I feel like it's my responsibility to point out that this is not a very desirable allocation of very scarce resources. <laughs> So anyway, um, <laughs> thankfully, I'm not all you have today. We have uh, with us, to share, to share in our happiness today, we have with us some great speakers. And thank you so much for being here. 
And um, these are speakers who are far wiser than I am, who are far more articulate than I am. Um, they have much more experience in the art of policy analysis and, of course, life in general. So I'm just going to talk to you about a few simple things. I'm going to share with you some of the ways in which being here at GSPP has changed my life and what it means to me to have this newly acquired status. So, a public policy analyst. Well, a good one is almost like a mythical creature. Um, a centaur. I, I could have just said a unicorn, but I promised myself that this speech would have no cliches. So, <laughs> so we go with centaur. We are, are that rare breed, that special cadre of people who have their feet rooted firmly to the ground, but our, our sight is always set on very high, very ambitious goals. Even when, when we're involved with everyday thankless tasks, like trying to figure out how to improve a voucher system or trying to best allocate water in a particular city, even when we're dealing with all of these practicalities, we're still driven by ideals, real ideals, meaningful ones, like justice, like equality, like human freedoms, and my favorite, like love. Let me, let me borrow from, from Che Guevara and let me say, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, that the true revolutionary is guided by feelings by great feelings of love. And at the end of the day, I think that that's what we all are, all us policy folks, analysts and activists, revolutionaries and dreamers who strive every day out of love for our communities, communities that transcend borders and generations, out of love for this planet and other living beings with whom we share this planet, out of love for each other and our shared collective futures. So, we are not just bureaucrats. Even though, yes, there will be paper, paper pushing in our futures, we are not just statisticians. Even though, of course, number crunching is going to be part of the job. We're not just politicians even though we're expected to be charming and tactful at all times, and thank God we are. <laughs> but we're all of that and so much more. Just, just this December, I was in Pakistan and I was, I was trying to explain to someone what public policy analysis is. And I was having a hard time trying to, trying, trying to explain what it is that I'm studying. And uh, my father was around and, and he, he just smiled and he chipped in. He said, she's learning how to make miracles happen. So this is my claim today. We are miracle workers. Because every day, we try to make a lot out of very, very little. And for this, I congratulate you. So on the behalf of the class of 2010, I would like to thank the Goldman School of Public Policy. I would like to thank our, our wonderful, fantastic faculty and, and our dedicated staff who have always made themselves available to us for, for advice on papers and projects, for advice on um, jobs and internships, and for, for more general emotional crises and <laughs> existential dilemmas. You, you have truly redefined the open door policy. You have given us perspective. And you've given each of us a way to find our own place in the world. And for that, we're grateful. You have given us the ability to have an insightful and adaptable worldview. Like many of my, my classmates and my friends here today, I come, from, I come from a developing country. I'm from Pakistan. And it's a country where, where people have experienced 
far more than their fair share of poverty and disempowerment. But being here at GSPP has made me realize that human tragedy on this scale exists everywhere. We just develop systems to manage it. We try to guard against it. And we reach out to those who survive it every day. The Goldman School of Public Policy is a place of great opportunity. And I will always remember it as such. We here through this program, we have had the flexibility and the resources to pursue a wide variety of, of interests and passions and goals. I, I, I should know. Um, for my final project, I wanted to do something that was, well, it was hardly a traditional APA. I, I wanted to build the foundation for an organization that would counter educational inequity in Pakistan, that would expand access to quality education in Pakistan. And this is not your traditional advanced policy analysis. I was armed with little more than a sense of urgency that I need to do it now. I need to start now. And, and thanks to the support of our faculty and our staff, I managed to do it. In fact, I managed to do more than I'd, I had hoped to in the beginning. Teach for Pakistan is going to be officially launched in July 2010. Thank you. Thank you. It's going to be an independent nonprofit that's going to recruit the best, most talented young men and women of Pakistan to teach for two years in under-resourced schools around the country. We're going to start rebuilding Pakistan one step at a time. And so this, there was this four-month-long final project, and now it's turned into a roadmap for my future. And I know that this story is not mine alone. I know that, that many of us sitting here today share this. And for that, I thank you, GSPP. And, and what to say of, of my friends and my classmates? You, you're, the, you're the leaves to my tree. You are, are the water in my stream. <laughs> you're the rain in my storm. <laughs> you're the colors of my rainbow. And for this fellowship, I thank you, GSPP. So there's a, there's a wonderful little twist on, on the old serenity prayer that we're all familiar with. And it, it makes me smile because it's so full of action. And I wanted to share it with you. It goes like this. It says, when I'm not home accepting what I can't change, I'm out there changing what I can't accept. <laughs> so this is my hope for all of us. May our days, may more of our days be filled with making change than the days that are filled with accepting, accepting things. Here's to the class of 2010. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our faculty speaker and one of my, my favorite people in all of Berkeley, Professor Eugene Bardach. Well, you can see why it's such a great pleasure to teach at GSPP because you have students like Khadija and you can see why GSPP as a community is infused with, with love, as she said. And uh, I will say that in our APA seminar in which Khadija was a participant, um, she got uh, tremendous encouragement from all of us uh, about what she was doing and advice from us. We would sit around sometimes until 10.30 in the evening at, our, at my house and kind of help her out and she would help us. It was just fantastic. And when she takes credit for what she's going to accomplish in the next several years, uh, she doesn't have to mention our name, 
but uh, we're going to be we're going to be right behind her. Um, Khadija did a lot of inspiration, and um, you didn't have to work hard for that. You just had to be uplifted. But I'm going to ask you to work because the title of my of my little talk is three lessons we, the faculty, might have forgotten to teach you, and if we did, maybe you weren't listening hard enough. So you have to listen up for just a few minutes and get these last three. Uh, I'm going to make these easy to remember because they all involve one four-word sentence, which you can remember forever from now. The sentence is, be for the kids, and the three lessons all can come back to you if you remember which of those words to underline as you go along. So we're going to start first by underlining kids. Lesson number one is get your priorities right. Now the kids here are actually a metaphor uh, for people who are systematically underrepresented in the halls of power, that their interests and needs don't get the voice that they ought to in the political process. But the metaphor has a particular reference point. And for me, and in this context, it's the particular kids, the sorts of kids that Jane Malden, Professor Jane Malden and I, met some years ago when we were doing a bunch of consulting for the California Conservation Corps, the CCC. We had been asked to do a cost-effectiveness analysis of this agency, which on the surface looked fantastic. Its mission is to take kids who are in their late teens, more or less, uh, who are kind of um, uh, lacking in some kinds of resources. Maybe they graduated, but don't really still know how to, to cipher and, and read and write. Uh, or maybe they never even graduated. And the CCC had a great idea, began in the 70s. Take these kids, put them out in the forest or something like it, let them get work experience and let them learn a bunch of things on the job in the real practical context of what they're doing. Um, and they're gonna do environmental stuff. They're gonna do stream reconstruction and they're gonna build trails and this is gonna be inspiring and wonderful and they'll be motivated to, to both do and to learn. Their motto, great motto for a public agency, right, is hard work, low pay, miserable conditions and more. Well, you have to love this, right? And they were much beloved, uh, and I think to some extent still are, by the political left and the political right. You can see why. These are kids who are needy. These are kids who are responsible. They're gonna take control of their lives. They're doing very green work. The right likes them because, hey man, it's work. It's responsibility. They're gonna get paid for this. You got it all. Um, so this basic strategy of work and re-socialization, very appealing. The people who do this, who work out there with them, you gotta love them, right? They're doing God's work. They're working with these difficult kids who turn out not to be so difficult because they're really wonderful. And when you get them working hard, they are an amazing thing to see. Unfortunately, and here's where policy analysis becomes a candidate for the dismal science. A bunch of studies about programs like this that we were finding, somewhat unexpectedly, I have to say, suggested that this basic strategy of work experience and re-socialization wasn't actually working for this age group. Great as it all felt and sounded, the data were not showing support. But we did find the study of the US Department of Labor Job Corps, which dealt with the same kind of population uh, and was showing pretty damn good results. A rate of ret uh, return of $2 for every $1 spent on a cost-benefit metric. Uh, at least at the time we read these studies, things have, uh, there's been some attrition of those numbers subsequently. And so we thought maybe we could persuade the CCC to do things like the, jo like the Job Corps because we see that works, we doubt this works, let's extrapolate good practice from what they're doing, okay? And in fact, in order to get their attention, we even went so far as to throw into our draft report an option that sounded like this. You know, the Job Corps really shows good numbers. If you, you could consider taking all the money that we spend on the CCC 
and spending it on added slots for California kids in the Job Corps. Oh, well, you can imagine how this is received in the agency, right? We're talking about putting them out of business. Now, we weren't really serious because that wasn't going to happen uh, for a lot of reasons, but we thought it might get their attention. But at the same time, it kind of raised a trade-off question, a priorities question. Um, it's a trade-off between what might be good for the staff of the agency, these wonderful people, believe me, you meet them and they're just wonderful, and the kids. The kids would be better off in the Job Corps, perhaps, but what about the staff of the CCC? Well, Jane and I thought about this a lot, and partly because, um, partly because we knew they weren't going to do it, and partly because we have tenure and our salaries come from, uh, from the University of California, we thought, well, we can, we can recommend that they seriously think about this. Um, and so when it came down to being for the provider interests, the nice staff versus the kids, we went for the kids. So as I say, be for the kids. Get your priorities right. When I used to tell this to students before you guys, to whom we forgot to tell this, they were kind of aghast. After all, those lovely, working, hardworking counselors of the CCC, they are us. We are them. Are we going to do something that puts their commitments, their lives in jeopardy? Well, yes. Because think about the people that you haven't spoken to yet. Think about if you were going down to South Central Los Angeles and talking to a, a disadvantaged kid that you pl plucked randomly from the street, age 17, 18, and that person asked you, what should I do for the next couple of years? I have an option. I could go to the CCC or I could go to the Job Corps. What do you think I should do? There's no doubt about it. Go to the Job Corps. Well, uh, if that's what you're going to say to the kid, why aren't you going to say that to the legislature? Well, there might be good reasons, but we decided that we were going to go for the kids. That brings me to lesson number two in the sentence, be for the kids, underline for. What does it mean to be for the kids? Well, in my short telling, focus on results. Focus on results. This is a big deal in policy analysis. This is a lesson you haven't heard. Well, yeah, you've heard it, but you haven't heard of the alternatives. And we're always thinking alternatives in public policy. If you're not going to focus on results, you might say, well, you know, what are you going to focus on? That's what we do. Aha, that's what you think now. But if you get out into the real world, you discover you don't necessarily do that. You focus on incremental change, not because it's going to be all that great, but because you can do it and because it's small and because, well, it seems to be going the right direction. And, it sort of makes you feel reasonable. In the CCC case, you could have said, hire more of these CCC staff, try to take a few more kids, spend a little bit more money. There were a lot of those things. Uh, have a little bit more education for the kids. Yeah, but it wasn't really radical enough. We really had to do something that was justified, not only spending the taxpayer money, but asking the kids to spend a year with us or in the CCC. Or you say, okay, let's do what the boss wants. Our boss in this case was an alumnus uh, of the school. It wasn't exactly the boss, but he was the liaison. I'm one of the, he wanted us to help the kids, but he also wanted us to straighten out this agency's fiscal and organizational uh, mess. And uh, there's plenty of fiscal and organizational mess to straighten out. And we made some stabs at it, but basically we said, we're not making this a priority. Organization can only do one thing at a time. And uh, the thing we got to choose is those kids. The other stuff will come in time if, if possible. Then there's symbolism. What do all the right-thinking people in my environment want? I'm going to do that. I'm going to be for that. Well, the right-thinking people in this environment were all the people who sort of like the CCC. And in particular, they loved the symbolism. You had a lot of great PR photographs of these conservation corps kids in, in, uh, in work uniforms fighting fires out there in the wilderness, because that's part of what they did. And it just made you feel too just great but it wasn't supported much by all the numbers and by a lot of other stuff. So symbolism isn't enough. And finally, in the sentence, be for the kids, underline B. The th and the third lesson on which you hang uh, B, uh, B is the hook for it, persist. Change takes time. Even Khadija's marvelous teacher of Pakistan is going to take many years before it finally reaches some threshold level where you feel it's got a real payoff. It takes years, very likely. The large-scale change, it has to be in the spirit not just of action, 
but uh, an action today and tomorrow and next week, but of existential commitment for a very long time. Khadija represents this. Max Weber, the great German sociologist of the 1920s, wrote a famous essay called Politics as a Vocation, in which he says, politics is the slow boring of hard boards. But your personal careers move on a much faster track than that. In the next five or six years, you're going to have two or three jobs, very likely. Before you've sunk roots, you're out. So what does that say about persistence? Well, I have three possible ideas about this. Make sure that whenever you leave your current job or assignment, you train your successor, and if possible, help to select him or her. Secondly, try to think about how you can institutionalize your good works so that they become part of the standard set of expectations and practices of whatever organization you're in. And third, and this is maybe the most interesting, important, and easy and fun to do, think networks. Think about how you can move around, not just in your own office or agency, but across organizations and in the network of policy professionals and policy advocates in your issue area. That's a pretty common way for people to move from job to job, uh, and it permits you to keep your commitment and your contacts and your sort of intellectual capital up to some reasonable level. And most of you, of course, being of your generation, are already a lot better networked than I am or anybody sitting up here. You know how to use the technology, and we're all for it. So there you are, the title of my talk. I promise to teach you three important things that we probably forgot to teach you. I'm going to repeat them. This is part of Public Speaking 101. Get your priorities right, focus on results and not on all those diversions, and be persistent. But what about the second half of my talk title? And if we did, you probably weren't listening hard enough. Mm -hmm. Well, now there's the rub. Were you listening hard enough? Actually, I think so, because we arranged it so there really wasn't too much else to do. <laughs> so I think my job is done, and so mostly is yours. And we can now proceed to the next phase, and it gives me pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah Anders and Lauren Hengel, who will present the class gift. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. So congratulations, graduates. This year, our class decided to provide future policy students with more scholarship opportunities and more financial support. We capitalized on the current UC Regent Young Alumni Fundraising Initiative, which matches every dollar we donate three to one for young alumni and current graduates. This year, this year's graduating class has donated the most amount of money in the history of the Goldman School of Public Policy even without the three to one match. Without the three to one match, our class gave over $14,000. And with the three to one match, we raised over $53,000 for scholarships. Additionally, because we reached over $10,000, which creates an endowment for the Goldman School, the Chancellor has matched our donation of $14,000 and contributed an additional $14,000 donation. On behalf of our class, Sarah and I would like to present Dean Brady and the Goldman School of Public Policy with a scholarship endowment for over $67,000 in the name of the class of 2010. Oh, you don't have to hand me something. <laughs> Thank you. That is, that's very creative financing. I'm very impressed. And it's really wonderful for us. You've really outdone yourselves, and it's an extraordinary accomplishment. This is actually not the check. This is her notes. But I thought we should have her hand me something, so it looks like we're really getting something. I'll hand you this back, and we'll get the check later. Thank you so much. That's just wonderful.
Oh, good morning, everybody. Uh, congratulations, Class 2010. And no one has said it yet, so I guess it's, uh, it's my responsibility to say that you've upheld the, tra trend, the tradition of being the best class ever at GSPP. <laughs> and, uh, and I just have to say that you are just awesome. That's just amazing what you guys did, and, and we love every single one of you. So uh, I'm, I'm here to announce the award for our outstanding graduate student instructor. And what everybody here knows, but perhaps what the parents don't know, is that at the School of Public Policy, we actually rely quite uh, strongly on our graduate student instructors in our core educational missions. Uh, essentially, for all of the classes we teach in the first year, which are very hard demanding courses, we have just wonderful, uh, usually second year students, who basically uh, um, sort of teach half the class with us. They interact a lot with the students, they teach their own private sections on Friday, they have office hours, they have therapy sessions, they, have, uh, they provide a lot of, of support to our students and, and they're invaluable and we wouldn't be able to operate without them. This year, uh, the Outstanding Graduate Student Instructor Award is being shared by, by two students who I've had the pleasure uh, to work closely with. Uh, so Jared Mason and Russell Voth, if you're here, could you come up to the stage? So uh, this is now my 14th year as a professor, and I've worked with a lot of graduate students in many different classes, and I have to say that, that this has been perhaps two of the best students that I've ever had working with me uh, in economics. So uh, both Jared and Russell are, they have sort of a, you know, um, un unquenchable intellectual curiosity. They very, very much like the field of economics, and so they're just sort of intellectually all for it. But on, on top of that, and on top of being extremely smart, they also had unbelievable connections to the students and really cared that they learned and uh, sort of gave 150% way beyond their pay grade uh, to, to the school. And you know that this was reflected largely in the comments that I got from the students. So I, I was sort of, it was almost, I was inundated with, with positive things about these two guys all throughout the year. And uh, I just want to say how much I appreciate them. And besides, I can't tell you how many times I was, I was sort of told about their stunning good looks. No, they are. So, so uh, it's my pleasure to present the outstanding graduate student instructor uh, to Jared Mason. Jared. Right. And to Russell Voth. And congratulations, class of 2010. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Dan Kamen, who will be presenting the Smolensky Prize for Outstanding Advanced Policy Analysis. Well, it's a real pleasure to get to continue the tradition of giving out some awards from, for some remarkable projects. And as you can see from your programs, the range of the APA projects is really remarkable. From proposals to reunite uh, di disappeared children from the, from the war in, in El Salvador, to efforts to deal with inner city transportation, to environmental issues, there's really a remarkable range. And we provide one penultimate prize, the Smolensky Prize, to one student for this, but I really urge you to look down the list of all of them. There's a remarkable range of different types of projects, many of which go directly into practice, and in fact, the winner this year does so. But I want to highlight from each of the sections, there was one picked out in each case. And I can tell you from my own section, it was very difficult to pick because there are so many interesting ones. But if I could just ask the students to stand who were nominated as finalists for the prize, Sarah Anders. <laughs> Michelle Alvaro Carpenter. Justina Cross. Aurora Kiviat. Jared Mason, double duty. Mohammed Asfar Nisar. 
Juan Quintero. Michael Shen. Kenji Shilaishi. And Sean Tanner. These are a remarkable set of projects, as I think you'll find many of the projects are. It was very difficult this year to pick one winner, and the one that was chosen did something very interesting. Not only did it embody what we call the Eightfold Path, finding different aspects of the policy exercise, communicating them clearly, examining the positives and the negatives of your case, but in this case, there was an interesting situation that has arisen with the incredible run-up and in interest in my own field, energy. And that is the country that really began the push to make photovoltaics an international product. That country is Japan. And Japan invested years of research and deployment in this area to discover that in the, la in the recent run-up of activity, China had surpassed Japan and everyone else in producing solar cells, and after a long series of economic doldrums in Japan, there was a real question how to build this program for the 21st century. This particular project was one that examined the history of what had gone on in this area and found that not only were there opportunities on an energy and climate basis, but there were job creation and other aspects of the story that made, that essentially reinvented the field of photovoltaics for the once and potential future leader in that area. So Kenji, congratulations. Come on up. I have to add one thing for, and for Kenji's story, and that is that we heard in the comments before that you do the policy, you write it up, and then you have to deal with it. Well, Kenji now has to go back and tell not only his own ministry in Japan, but also the Ministry of Economics and Finance that this is a good idea. So this comes with an award now, but it comes with a great deal of very difficult work afterwards. So congratulations. Well, I think that just shows you how seriously people take the APAs and the kind of quality that we get out of that project, which I think is a great stepping stone for people to go on in their careers and be, as they are, extraordinarily successful. It's now my very happy duty to introduce our graduation speaker. Uh, Michael Nacht uh, just stepped down, although actually I've got to tell you a story about this in a minute. He just stepped down as Assistant Secretary of Defense for Global Strategic Affairs, that's GSA in OSD in Pentagonese. Did I get that right, Michael? Yes, okay. Uh, now, he stepped down yesterday, but it turns out because they don't have a new person in place, I guess, until Monday or whatever, he's still on the government payroll, sort of. And so as we tried to get him here and wanted to pay for his airplane and his hotel and so forth, we had to spend hours with the Pentagon making sure that we didn't have any conflict of interest or other kinds of problems. So I want you to know that, that Michael is fully vetted. The Pentagon says he can be here. There's no ethics violations that we know of. We think we're okay, I hope. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Uh, this is his third tour of government service. 
Uh, in the Clinton administration, he was assistant director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, in which he uh, participated in five Clinton summits with uh, Russian and Chinese leaders. He also worked uh, much earlier in his career at NASA on launch vehicle stability, because his background is in aeronautical engineering. He's also a distinguished academic with five books and over 70 articles to his credit. He taught at Harvard University and was the dean at the University of Maryland School of Public Affairs. But this last year, he outdid himself being involved in several of the major initiatives of the Obama administration with respect to nuclear weapons. Uh, he was involved with the New START Treaty, with the 2010 Ballistic Missile Defense Review, and with the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review. His portfolio at GSA and OSD uh, was weapons of mass destruction. So before you is Dr. Strangelove, <laughs> who is knowledgeable about biological warfare, nuclear warfare, cyber warfare, space warfare, and probably kinds of warfare that I've never even imagined. I'm looking forward, as he returns to the Goldman School of Public Policy, uh, to learning more about what he did in Washington, and I'm sure he's going to tell us about that today. Uh, the most important thing about Michael is that he was our dean from 1998 to 2008. He's responsible uh, for the new building, uh, along with the previous dean, Gene Smolensky. Uh, he did extraordinary things for the school in fundraising, creating a basis for me as the new dean to find out that it was really easy to become dean because there was a wonderful staff, a wonderful building, a wonderful set of traditions, and just an extraordinary number of things that he'd contributed to. From my perspective, it feels like a big brother has just come home who's going to now take care of me as I go on as dean. So it's my great thrill, my great pleasure, really the most wonderful thing I could imagine at the end of my first year to welcome back Michael Nacht uh, to the Goldman School of Public Policy. Thank you very much. It's, uh, first of all, let me thank Henry for that wonderful introduction. You know the line, uh, uh, my parents have long departed, but uh, the line is that uh, uh, my mother would have believed it and my father would have enjoyed it too, you know. <laughs> um, first, uh, my first opportunity to congratulate the graduates, um, which we'll get a, more of a chance to uh, do in a minute, uh, the class of 2010 at the Goldman School, and to congratulate the family and friends and supporters of the students uh, who basically enabled you to do this. Um, it's great to be home again. And it's great to be home at GSPP. It's great to be home at Cal Berkeley. It's great to be home in the Bay Area. If you want a sense of community, come to GSPP. It's a fabulous place. Now, you folks are, for the most part, about to leave GSPP, unless you're going to go on for further study. And uh, I'm here to offer a few thoughts about uh, the pluses and minuses you're taking uh, off to in your travels and your careers. And then I'll tell you a little bit about, give you a little flavor of some of my recent experiences. Hopefully they'll relate to uh, your future experiences. And then a few final thoughts. Uh, pluses. You wouldn't have been really talented and smart and worked hard uh, if you weren't admitted here in the first place. So you're all at least type A academic personality types and, ac and policy personality types. Um, you are armed with a superb degree from one of the world's great universities and as good a public policy school as there is anywhere. You have a skill set, methodological skills, management skills, political analysis skills, and substantive knowledge which should launch you toward fabulous careers ahead. So these are assets that you have now acquired, thinking for second in financial terms, and they will pay off dividends for the rest of your life. So make sure that, keep cultivating them. 
no matter what you do, and you may change many times, as, uh, as Jean and, and Henry have said, but this is an investment for a lifetime, so cherish it. But there are challenges. I really have to uh, practically apologize from my generation to yours for the mess that we've handed over to you. Wherever you look, there are problems. And this is not just to perpetuate the field of public policy <laughs> so that you have something to do. Right? I mean, if we look economically at the local level uh, right here in the East Bay, if we look at the state level, if we look at the national level, if we look globally at the Greek situation and the future of the Euro, I mean, these are unprecedentedly difficult economic times. Uh, social and welfare policy issues for which a number of you are committed couldn't be more stressful at the moment. Education policy, our colleague David Kirp and others are experts. K through 12 is in a crisis in this country, almost unprecedented. And we know that, that uh, universities and colleges are equally deeply stressed. Climate change, you heard from one of the great uh, national experts, Dan Kamen. Climate change, Gulf of Mexico oil spills. I mean, we are facing enormous difficulties. Housing policy, and all this in a time of terrorist attacks, of two wars that have now gone on much longer each than World War II, with a president who very much wants to wind them down not build them up. So these are just extraordinarily unprecedented difficulties that you're going to face. And uh, you're going to need all of your assets to really, uh, to really cope with them. Now let me give you a little bit of flavor of a few things I've been doing in the, in the past year. I've actually been on leave two years from the school. I had a sabbatical and then I was on leave in the, in the administration for a year. First, I can honestly say it was a great honor and privilege to be uh, uh, an appointee of President Obama. I think he is an extraordinary leader. He faces these terrible challenges, but he's doing everything he can to make this a much better world. I joined a department that was uh, and is led by Robert Gates a holdover from the Bush administration who the president has selected to continue and he is a masterful leader. Um, it is an enormous effort to uh, try to lead the Department of Defense which has just so much, the scope of its activities is, is truly uh, uh, boggles the mind. In my era I had these responsibilities that uh, Dean Brady mentioned. I'd like to give you just a few snippets from two of them one that hopefully you'll never have to deal with, nuclear weapons, and one that you deal with every day, cyber, which were both in my areas of responsibility. The president concluded that the current and future environment of states and of grievances by non-governments means that there's been a shift in the main challenge for nuclear weapons and it has to do with stopping their spread to other governments and stopping the acquisition and use of these weapons by terrorist organizations. And this has led to a reorientation, a really fundamental reorientation in U.S. nuclear strategy, the first reorientation since the end of the Cold War. The president is an amazing individual who lays out a vision. He's got government types like myself through this weekend to try to make things happen. The government has to implement the vision. So how do you do that? How do you shift the strategy? How do you reduce the numbers and roles of nuclear weapons in US policy? How do you get the world moving toward a world of zero nuclear weapons? How do you actually make that happen? Well, the government is a large place with many agencies. Obviously, the Defense Department is a key agency, but not the only agency that would be engaged in this issue. And we were, had been assigned by the Congress to report in about a year 
this changed nuclear posture called the Nuclear Posture Review. It was started in April of 2009 and it just finished last month and I was quite intimately involved in all phases of it. What does it actually mean to be intimately involved in all phases of a study like this, a study that has high presidential attention and interest? It means you go through, in my own group, in my own, with my own colleagues, outlines of ideas, ultimately PowerPoint presentations. PowerPoint is the language of the Pentagon and may well be the PowerPoint for, uh, maybe the language for many of you, not for all of you. I'm not, frankly, the biggest fan of PowerPoints, but it can stultify creative thought, but it also has advantages. And then presenting these ideas to different constituencies, all of whom would be affected by the policy changes you are advocating. In the Department of Defense alone, there are other groups in policy where I was who would be affected by these changes if we're talking about changes on European nuclear policy. So the Europeanists have to weigh in on what we're thinking. The East Asian specialists who are concerned about Jap Japan and South Korea and our alliances with them in the face of a threat from North Korea, they have a stake in this. So many policy groups have a role and they want to hear what the ideas are. There are many, many other parts of the Defense Department not directly related to policy. Right? There's acquisition. The, the, they're the folks who buy the weapons or cancel the contracts for the weapons. Multi-billion dollar programs. If money is freed up in one area, maybe it can be spent better in another area. In these economic cl uh, climate, maybe money's freed up in one area won't be spent in any area. It'll just be a contribution to reduction of the deficit. And there's tremendous pressure on every government agency to spend less to reduce the deficit. The military services, which are divided into many different features. There are the, there are the services themselves. There's the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I won't uh, offer the full uh, complex array, just to say there are scores of interest groups with genuine concerns about our slides and our ideas just in the Defense Department. Once we had a Defense Department position, which ultimately had to get approved by the Secretary of Defense, we go and march off into the interagency. If you get to Washington, you'll hear about the IA, or interagency. That means you're now sitting in a room on this subject because of its sensitivity and importance. The room was in the White House, in the so-called situation room of the White House, if you ever saw some uh, films and television shows. Uh, you can actually see they've taken public photos of the president in the situation room. I've been in that room. It's actually a small suite of rooms. Many, many times they're intentionally small, so a lot of people can't get in there. And we would have sent in, our, in advance our ideas, and the State Department is there to comment on them, and the Department of Energy, because it deals with nuclear weapons, is there, and the intelligence community is there to tell us what they know about what other countries are doing in, these, in this area. And the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which has a couple of major figures in it currently uh, from, the, from the Bay Area or who are graduates of ERG and other, other places. Um, so the main point is the interagency is a group of quite senior people, very knowledgeable, and they each have their own perspective on these ideas. And they're not there just to agree to your ideas. This is chaired by a very senior person uh, from the White House staff. And then if we reach agreement, it moves up the chain to the, ultimately to the so-called the principles. This is Hillary Clinton, Bob Gates, <coughs> uh, Denny Blair, who's the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Admiral Mullen, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and others, and they review it still again, and ultimately it goes to the President for his approval. Well, when we went through this process, we didn't reach quick agreement on a number of issues, so we had to go back and revise. And once policy revises, that means all the other constituencies in the building get another look at it. It's called get a chop at it. This is a government term. Chop means you get a chance to propose edits or changes to a document that you've received. Well, can you imagine, get, just think of yourself sitting in a room with a document that you've composed, and now you're getting all of these edits. It's not just the professor's edits, which are difficult enough to deal with, 
But supposing you get 15 or 20 different organizational inputs, and they're not always in agreement. And you have to try to adjudicate across all of this stuff. So this is part of what the government does when it makes policy. It's adjudicating interagency agreements. <coughs> Ultimately, it's been alleged in one blog that there were 150 senior level meetings on this subject. There were 30 White House meetings. Actually, I know for a fact that's a low number. The president was formally briefed on this document at least twice. He read it completely cover to cover at least twice. And he ultimately approved the document, which was released on April 6th. Once it's released, that's not the end of the story, because first of all, it has sets of recommendations of then how you, how you make it happen. And not only that, not other governments had input to the study, and they want to know, well, what does it mean for us? So you have to go talk to them, you have to go talk to folks in South Korea, and in France, and in Britain, and in countries around the world. You have to talk to the media. The media wants to know, what does this mean? This is a kind of vague sentence. What does it really mean? You have to try to explain it. You hear from think tanks across the political spectrum, some of whom are very enthusiastic, some of whom are very critical. And you hear from the Congress, which is deeply knowledgeable. They have staff who are knowledgeable about every single issue you can imagine. Uh, they have tremendous capability at the staff level and ultimately at, at the member level. So that means you're dealing with all of these different constituencies, and that's a key element of the job of a policy person. It's true with modification in Sacramento. It would be true with modification in the city of San Francisco. So again, in my case, I had to generate support from and ultimately get approval from my own colleagues. I had about 100 people working directly for me. My other colleagues in policy, people throughout the department, people in the interagency, the Congress, the think tank community, non-government, and, uh, and the media. Uh, that's for one study. And um, we were hopeful that it would make a difference. But this was actually only one element of the president's nuclear strategy in the short term, all of which is just rolled out in the last couple of months. Just let me quickly say that we did reach a new agreement with the Russians to lower the numbers of nuclear weapons. And by the way, we released the total number of nuclear weapons that the US has. The US has never, never in its history from 1945 until Monday, May 5th, 2010, formally released the numbers of nuclear weapons it has. We did so as part of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Review Conference at the UN in New York. I spoke at the UN on Wednesday, the 5th of May. We announced that we had at one time in the late 60s 31,000 nuclear weapons. We now have 5,000 nuclear weapons and we're prepared under the president's guidance to go all the way down. For some, people, people are impatient. Why go through all this? Just get rid of them. <laughs> Why go through these 700 steps? Well, because it turns out, because of the because first of all, there are arguments on, on, good arguments on multiple sides of almost every issue. It's not easy to move, even if you have a revolutionary vision like the president's, it's not easy to move in a revolutionary fashion right away. You have to move through steps. And we have to see the reaction of other governments and the cooperation that's going to be needed from international agencies. The president convened uh, in, uh, in April, April 12th and 13th, the largest groups of heads of state in Washington ever to convene in the United States since the last time such a group met, which was in 1945 in San Francisco to establish the UN. Not too many of us were around at that meeting in San Francisco in 45. Well, the next big one was uh, April 12th and 13th in Washington, 2010 to discuss how we're going to control fissile material so that particularly terrorists can't get a hold of these weapons. Because from what we know, everything we know from the intelligence community about what some of these groups say, what they've done, 
assignments that they've given to their colleagues, actions that they've taken. They are dedicated to trying to acquire weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, and in some cases use them. And the, the highest priority target is an American city. Well, we cannot, we just can't let that happen. We have to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. So it's been a real privilege to be part of the team, as you see a vast team, probably involving hundreds of people, to move this along. And I think the president has made some real strides. I would say I've been in, in Washington for the end of the beginning of this policy. Now let me get something closer to home to you, which is cyber. Uh, you know, it's a truism. We all know we live in this interconnected world. It's amazing what, uh, what the Silicon Valley community uh, and uh, other computer manufacturers have produced. It's changed all of our lives. And initially, we thought it's fantastic. And the internet in particular and cyberspace is a, maybe a free good and open to all. What could possibly be disadvantageous there? Well. It also means we are deeply reliant on all of this information and these systems, right? We're reliant, maybe we're reliant on our email accounts. We're certainly reliant on our financial accounts, which are increasingly computerized. We're going through a digitization of medical records. Soon there won't be any paper medical records. The air traffic controller who held up my plane at Dulles Airport until 15 minutes before the flight would have been canceled and I would not have been here last night, he's operating on computer systems. Um, and at the national security level, all of our early warning systems that we might be attacked are computer-based. So we are hugely reliant, as increasingly all developed countries are and many developing countries are, on computer systems. And now there's a whole huge field of efforts to attack those systems, to exploit the data in the systems, to exfiltrate, if you want the term, remove data from the systems for their own purposes, to distort the data, and then possibly also to attack the systems themselves. On July 4, 2009, I was dealing with a mini crisis in Northeast Asia, a North Korean ship had left North Korea with what we thought was very nasty material. And it was up to the US to decide what to do about that ship under UN guidance. And it was up to policy to guide the Navy as to what to do. And for six hours, so this is not concepts, this is not PowerPoints, this is a different kind of the job. This is, for six hours, I'm part of a group saying, should the US Navy intervene? Should they request to board the ship? What happens if they're denied access? Is it in international waters? A whole variety of questions. And right at that time, there was a cyber attack on our systems. So we were not functioning properly. We were not communicating properly with ourselves. This is the modern world we're living in. A professor from GSPP is talking to folks about what the Navy should do in the South China Sea against a North Korean ship while his computer systems are being attacked. This is the current world. I mean, our, our parents, our grand, you know, couldn't have imagined this world. And now we're living through the world. So there's an enormous effort to build up defenses of cyber systems. There are three main cyber systems without going into a lot of detail. There's what we call the dot mil system. This is how the military communicates with itself. It's very important. The Defense Department's job is to protect those systems. And they're being attacked all the time. There's the dot gov system, which is all the other branches of government. You know, if Health and Human Services wants to talk to the Department of Interior, they do it on a computer system, that's dot gov. At the moment, the Department of Homeland Security is charged with protecting those systems. They have a tremendous sort of human capability to do it, but they don't have the machines. And they're missing some key expertise in protecting the systems. And then there's .com, which is where 95% of the world is communicating, and no one is in charge of protecting those systems. Do you know that some of the biggest banks in, in the United States, Citigroup, have been attacked? 
Do you know that the NASDAQ has been attacked? Do you know that uh, air traffic systems in major airports have been attacked? So this is a, an enormous growth stock. I've said somewhat jokingly to my two sons who've already established their careers, if they were interested in thinking of switching, become a cyber lawyer. Highly lucrative. Uh, it, it, it will involve mastery of a lot of technical information, but also the amount of contentiousness will also will be enormous. Because one of the key issues is in seeking to defend .mil or .gov or .com, you inevitably confront challenges between national security and civil liberties. Are you willing to have folks monitor your email to make sure that uh, some other system is protected? Probably not. Well, how do we decide? How does Congress decide? There are now 53 committees and subcommittees of the Congress set up to deal with this issue. So we are just in the infancy. I think we're in the preschool stage of cybersecurity. And this will be an enormous growth area for good and for ill in, in the decades to come. So it's been a privilege to be part of the beginning of the beginning of cyber. Now, some final thoughts for you guys. One is, you're gonna to have to learn the language of the government agency you're a part of. Every agency, I don't care if it's in Pakistan or Sausalito, has a standard set of procedures, has language, has a whole approach, and you have to get it. My very first day on the job in the Arms Control Agency, 16 years ago in the Clinton administration, my very first moment, it's like going in the first grade to school with your pencil case, I walked into the State Department, and the very first words I heard was one of my colleagues said to another colleague, did the CODEL take Miller? Did the CODEL take Miller? Now probably some of our government types on the faculty here and some others might know, but how many of you know what that means? Raise your hands. Uh, at least three. So did the congressional delegation take a military aircraft? That's all it meant. Right, Congress is always taking trips from here to there, from there to here. And one wondered, did they take a military aircraft or did they fly civilian? This is how business gets made every single minute of every single day in the government. Through shorthand, through acronyms, through code words, you've got to learn the language. If you don't know the language, you're out to lunch. When I first heard that, my very first thought was, resign. <laughs> it's hopeless. It would take, the Rosetta Stone hadn't been in, invented. It would take me 25 years to learn this language. And I can tell you, the Pentagon makes the State Department look like child's play in terms of acronyms and special buzzwords. So learn the language. The second, if you become somewhat of an in and outer like some of us on the faculty have, you know, you're not a careerist. You may well become a careerist in government. But if you're not, if you go in and hop out and go in and hop out, just realize how you get in may never be clear and how you get out may never be clear. I'll give you one other minor uh, experience of my own. After 9-11, I was called by a very senior retired military officer saying that they were putting together a special advisory group on the possible use of weapons of mass destruction in the United States by terrorists. Would I serve on the group? I said, of course. I'll do what I can. I'm here at Berkeley, but I'll come in for meetings. I'll respond and so forth. So I did that. And I had an amazing experience for three years. And after three years, he said to me, you know, Michael, you've done a good job. We'd like to reappoint you but we want to make sure you're interested first. I said, absolutely, I'm ready to do it. And this is 2004. And he called up and said, Michael, you are not reappointed. I said, really? He said, yes, the White House vetoed you because they learned you're a Democrat. <laughs> so he said, you have to realize, Michael, how people get these jobs and how people lose these jobs. I said, really, what, what's the story? He said, well, you got the job through a clerical error. <laughs> and you lost the job because they found the error. <laughs> so don't ever be too secure if you're in and out. You never know what's gonna happen. You never know how you got there. You never know how long you're gonna laugh. Even in this most recent job, people said to me, Michael, don't worry about it. It's basically a half-time job. Half-time in the Defense Department, not bad. What they didn't tell me was half-time was roughly 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. It's 12 of the 24 hours. <laughs> Every day as a base, 
And then you really get started, because then after all the meetings are over, you can really get to work. So that was the routine, 7.30 to 7.30, roughly, five, out, five days a week, plus some weekends. And then when I get home for dinner by 8.30 or 9, I would have about 20 emails. And I'd say half of them required serious thought and extensive responses. So that meant at least a couple of hours of additional work. And I can tell you I'm not alone. It's very normal. This is the stuff of political appointees in the modern uh, government of the United States. So be careful. Be careful if you want to really work these hours. I told you about the July 4th that people said, Michael, it's a bonus. You get to work July 4th on North Korea. It's fantastic. And they even had another bonus for me just recently. When we were finishing up the Nuclear Posture Review, they said, Michael, Easter Sunday, how about five hours in the Pentagon going over the final edits? Great, I said. <laughs> Wonderful. So in fact, there were, there were mistakes in the photo captions. Of course, the mount put this in, and there it is. My language is in there. So these are the bonuses you'll have uh, being in. Uh... Now, final, final thoughts. I'm sorry if I'm taking too long. The first is, you will have choices in your careers. They will vary. And what you're interested in today may not be what you're interested in eight or 10 years from now. Uh, my suggestion is make a simple chart, hopefully handwritten, not computer written, of the pluses and minuses of the choices. This is a rational analysis, comes right out of the analytic core of the Goldman School. You'll learn about your thoughts and choices from the analysis. But ultimately, say to yourself, what tingles? What tingles? And the decision rule is follow the tingle. Because if you don't follow the tingle, you'll always wonder, what would have I happened if I did follow the tingle? So that's one point, follow the tingle. A second point is, and this goes back, probably hardly anyone in this room knew about the professional basketball team, the New York Knicks in the late 60s. This is really dating me. But they had a wonderful coach, Red Holtzman, who used to say he had very good players, but not the best. They were B plus, A minus players. They were not A triple plus. He said, if we're going to win, we have to play like a team uniquely honed. And the term he used was to each player, see the court. See the court. Not just only see yourself, your job, get your stuff done, become an expert in your area. See the interrelationships. See who's powerful. Understand how things, are, how you can build coalitions to get support. If you don't see the court, you're not going to make a lot of progress because coalitions are inherently essential for good public policy, no matter how innovative the idea is. And the third, really make sure you give it your best shot. There's a famous story when Kissinger was national security advisor. He asked one of his senior people to write a paper on China. And then when the person came in, he ripped it apart verbally. The man went out humbled, rewrote it, and this happened five times, five times. And this was a very distinguished China specialist. And then the man came in exhausted. And Kissinger said, is this the absolute best you can do? He said, Mr. Secretary, I can't do any better than this. This is it. And Kissinger said, good, I'll read it now. Make sure you do your really best work. It's not going to be the first draft. If you follow the tingle, see the court, and try your best, you'll do really great and we'll be so proud of you. So thank you very much. Stay there a minute. So you can see why we're thrilled to have Michael back, and I want to welcome Michael Nacht back to the Goldman School of Public Policy. This is the part of the program where we award degrees, but before doing that, I, I wanted to make sure that we remember the people who really did a lot of the work to make sure that the graduates got their degrees. I want to remember the families and the friends all of you in the audience behind the graduates here, 
sort of metaphorically correctly, who did really all the work. Thank you. Thank you. You're the people who have provided the support so that our graduates could get through what is really a very demanding program. To award the PhD degrees, we have David Kirp, a distinguished member of our faculty who writes readable, wonderful, award-winning, and analytically very provocative books, and another one of our wonderful faculty members, David Kirp. Michael, welcome back. I can see why Berkeley and San Francisco might hold special allure. You won't have those 7.30 in the morning briefings that we can just begin to imagine might be, might be like, but if you were to talk about them, they'd probably kill you. So uh, it's nice to know you'll be unclassified. We're instituting 7.30 a.m. faculty meetings. There we go. <laughs> So I have the altogether happy job of awarding the PhD degree to Felicity Culp. Felicity, if you'd come join me on the stage. So come, come stand by me while I say some nice things about you. Um, <laughs> Actually, Felicity's following Michael is perfect because it's sort of the other half of the circle. Felicity um, came to the Goldman School in 2004. She had her uh, master's in policy degree at Duke. She quickly overcame that disadvantage. Um, <laughs> and she, she, she came with, a, with a, an interest that's unconventional the Goldman School and also very important. What the joinder of human rights and public policy and public law would look like. Now, as many of you know, there are lots of human rights treaties out there, signed sort of in the, many of them in the flush of the post-World War II era, almost every country in the world. Uh, the question that Felicity was really asking was, do they mean much? Do they mean anything? How do law and policy intersect? Under what circumstances she was particularly interested in? Do the basic social and economic rights, like educate, the right to education, the right to decent health care, rights that are guaranteed by those treaties, under what circumstances do they get enacted and why? That's a really important intellectual question. And to answer that question, Felicity put together an amazing data set this is a phrase that will be well known to the master students, but let me just say to the, to the audience, generally it means tons and tons of persistent work. Um, and it's a really important question to policymakers and to all of us who care about how it is that you get decent food and shelter and social rights and gender equality, education um, across the globe. Now, Felicity has been a student for six years. That's pretty typical for a PhD. Um, and, and I should say, by the way, the PhD degree is a rarity here. Um, Felicity um, is the 53rd student in the four decades of the school to be awarded um, the PhD. Um, so six years is a pretty typical period of time, but along the way, she managed to earn a master's degree in the political science department and the equivalent of a master's in law and human rights from Oxford University. And that's not all she did while she was here. She worked in Geneva for the UN High Commission on Human Rights. She coordinated a mission that was funded by USAID to combat tuberculosis in the Ukraine and just in case you think everything that she's done is, is highfalutin and, and exalted, she also contest, consulted with Contra Costa County on how to regulate Indian gaming. It's kind of random. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, one sort of interesting story is that that Felicity is here um, is, a, is a, in some ways a stroke of real luck because the uncharacteristic dilatoriness she waited 
until the last moment to file for her PhD. The last day, in fact, before she was returning to Duke where she has been living and working in North Carolina, um, it happened to be the day of a major student protest of the budget cuts. The students were outside the building where the registrar's office is. The police were ringing the building and Stephanie and, and uh, Felicity says she came early in the morning kind of wearing pajamas and sweatpants and, and running shoes to see if she could beat the crowd and snuck into the building and was roaming around looking for somebody and what she found was a security policeman um, who thought she might be crazy. Um, <laughs> I mean, who's running around, you know, in such an outfit, sort of saying, you know, here's my, here's my dissertation. Um, but she was really, what she was really after this, was this lovely little custom that our hyper-bureaucratized institution has. You get a lollipop when you turn in your PhD dissertation. <laughs> it's the finished lollipop. That's P-H-I-S-H-E-D, right? Finished. Bad pun, you know, university registrar, what do you expect? <laughs> but it matters, it's a coveted thing. And finally, after running around and ultimately being escorted into the registrar's office, leaving her dissertation, getting her lollipop, being escorted out, Felicity got here. Um, for that and for a lot of hard and wonderful work, Felicity is receiving her doctorate. Now, I believe that Awarding these degrees should not only be an kind of exalted occasion, it should be a fun occasion. And so I try to think about what gift might be appropriate for a newly minted PhD. <laughs> oh God, right? So why don't you begin opening this thing while I describe what is in it. I thought Felicity's work has spanned the globe. So maybe a globe would be appropriate. <laughs> But, you know, Felicity is doing, I'm going to open this up. Okay, Felicity is doing, is doing unconventional work. And so maybe an unconventional globe would be an appropriate gift. So here we have a globe. <laughs> Good face. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> now to the, to the serious part of the, of the story. Um, Hey, congratulations. Uh, it's my pleasure to convey the PhD degree on Anna Trailer. Anna, would you please come up to the podium? So Anna and I have been working together for quite some time. And I remember very, very clearly when she decided she wanted to do her PhD because she was an MPP degree first and decided to come back after, after a year outside the university. And Anna was really driven by, by two passions. First, she has sort of an undying interest in trying to understand the sources of racial inequality in the United States. And at the same time, she also has very, very deep interests in health policy. And she spent her first year or two as a PhD student taking classes and statistical methods and in coursework where she was reading furiously and trying to decide where's the best way to direct her passions. And she finally settled on sort of a natural uh, combination of the two, namely trying to understand what drives racial differences in health outcomes in the United States, but more importantly, what can we do to perhaps improve some of those, uh, those outcomes and perhaps narrow those differences. And so being the entrepreneurial person she was, she managed somehow to sort of work her way into the inner sanctum at Kaiser Permanente and get them to turn over to her literally hundreds of thousands of records on every person in their system with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, 
uh, on their visits, on their health outcomes in terms of the results of diagnostic tests, when they meet with their doctors, on how many prescriptions they've been prescribed and whether they fill them and so on and so forth. And I remember, just to convey you the amount of work this was, when she got this data and we were all happy and she has these discs the day she comes to my office, she's like, I have hundreds of thousands of records, what do I do now? <laughs> And, and it's, you know, you think in the, in the background there are these details when you do research. You just, oh, well, somebody will figure out what to do with that. Well, figuring out what to do with it is not such an easy thing, right? It's a big deal. And, and sort of, you know, after, after that little coup, uh, Anna then spent the next couple of years figuring out what to do with it. So spending many, many, many days and months learning how to work with large databases, how to program and Stata and other programs, and how to essentially take an enormous amount of information, you know, sort of administrative records for every diabetic in, in Kaiser Permanente, and draw from that clear questions that not only would sort of answer what she was interested in, but be of use to people. So I want to tell you a little bit about essentially what Anna did and what Anna found. So the, the interesting thing, one of the most interesting things that, that if you think about what might be driving racial disparities in health, you can pretty clearly and, and quickly come up with a laundry list. So number one, there are large differences in disparity in health insurance coverage. There are differences in socioeconomic status. There's differences in people's lifetime history, and we know where you grow up uh, tends to impact how you're doing later in life in terms of your health. And there's differences in behavior, and there may be differences if you hold all that stuff constant in terms of how you interact with a health system and a health provider. And so Anna's work is, is unique in the sense that she has information on, on, a, on a large group of people who, who have a diagnosable condition, but they all have health insurance and they're all part of the same uh, basically health system. They're all Kaiser Permanente members. And one of the first things she found was despite that, that fact, you still saw large disparities in uh, how well people with diabetes were doing uh, that, that correlated with race whether or not they were able to gain good control of, of their disease, whether they in, adhered to their uh, pharmacological uh, therapies. And not only that, but how, how physicians were treating them. So whether physicians were intensifying their treatment when needed, and so on and so forth. So one of, you know, the initial part of her dissertation essentially documents these sort of glaring disparities, which is quite amazing given the fact that we're looking within a single system. But she didn't stop there. Anna then went to look at what were the specifics about doctor-patient relationships that might be uh, driving these disparities. In particular, she wanted to see whether or not there was any impact of having doctors that might be culturally competent in the sense that, that they might uh, better relate to patients uh, that, that are African-American or Latino, and whether that impacted how well the patients were doing. So she devised a very clever strategy for essentially assessing whether or not African-American patients that are matched to African-American doctors do better than African-American patients that are matched to white doctors, whether Latino Spanish speaking patients that match to Latino doctors or, or doctors that, that could speak their language did better uh, than others. And it, it, it was uh, what, what's really fascinating and, and fantastic about this dissertation is how she started from something that was just a passion, right? Wanting to understand the structural inequalities in our society and very quickly sort of worked down to very, very specific questions that not only documented the mechanisms that essentially drive some of the disparities we see, but actually generated information that was actionable to a major player in healthcare, right? In terms of how they deliver uh, their health services and how they could better serve their patients and how they can better ensure uh, the health of, 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 of their clients, right, and of, of people in general. And so it's a wonderful accomplishment. It was an enormous amount of work, and it's, I, I'm proud of her, and it's, it's just a, a great thing that we're here today and, and that Anna has finished. And last thing I want to say is that Anna it, has a job, which is fantastic, and I'm sure it won't, won't be her first, and, and she's going to go uh, many great places, but she's a senior research analyst at uh, Kaiser Permanente, and she's doing lots of work for them on larger data sets. So,
Okay, so now we'll have Assistant Dean uh, Martha Chavez and, and uh, Dean Henry Brady will be presenting the MPP degrees. So now we will begin the presentation of the MPP degrees. Jacob Ackerman. Sarah Elizabeth Anders. Michelle Arevalo Carpenter. Omar Aslam. Khadija Shapur Bakhtiar. Mary Ann M. Bates. Karen P. Ben Moshe. Michael Joseph Benke. Zara Marie Florano Bukirin. Ryan Daniel Chan. Michelle L. Chang. <laughs> Nithin Chabe. Mika Lien Clark. Allison S. Cohen. Caitlin J. Connors. Daniel Cooney. Justina Cross. Dipti Thesai. Nathaniel B. Duart. Thania Duta. Muhammad Umer Farouk. Todd Folly King. Kristen Burton Ferris. Christine Louise Fry. Megan Garcia. Ilana J. Golan. Nate Gottfried. Antoine Gutman. Javier Jorge Gutierrez Adriansen. Jesse Andrew Heitner. Lauren Oaken Hengel. Erica C. Kashiri. Aurora D. Kiviat. Kohei Kiyono.
Rebecca Kleinman. Ellen Love. Kok Lung Lai. Amina P. McCree. Joseph A. Milbury. Give me a. <laughs> Eduardo Montoya. Brenda R. Munoz. Ernesto Munoz Lamartín. Juan Young Park. Deepa Patel. Yan Pua. Alexander William Polta. Juan Felipe Quintero. Manaswini Rao. Elizabeth Redman. Tara M. Regan. Armando Salcedo Cisneros. Carrie Ann Scheib. Mike Shen. Kenji Shilaishi. Hosang San. Catherine Stewart. Asadala Tahir. Sean Tanner. <laughs> Li Bei Tian. Martin Fleming von Genechten. <laughs> Russell Voth. Marcella Wagner. Daniel Widom. Wan Yi Drow. Yan Zhu. Well, this is always a thrilling event, no, uh, no more so than today. It was just, just wonderful. Oh, by the way, I do want to say that the GSA OSD did not take Mill Air. Did I get that right? <laughs> Commercial airplane. This is where I get to say uh, the lines that show that I have a little bit of power as dean, and it is this, which actually confers the degrees. This is supposedly the legal moment where it really happens. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the President and Regents of the University of California, I grant you these degrees from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Congratulations to the Goldman School class of 2010.